So good evening, everybody. My name is Jennifer Sparkman, and I am on the ESA Foundation Board of Directors. I'd like to thank everyone for attending the Foundation's workshop of the ABCs of Parliamentary Procedure. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. This workshop is being recorded, so please silence any cell phones and consider muting your audio. I'd like to start out by introducing Ann Southall who will share a few words, and then she will introduce our speaker for this evening's workshop. Anne is a former ESA Arkansas State President, and she is also the Foundation's Board Chair. Um, Anne is passionate about this subject, and it's evident in her leadership. She leads with creativity, with wisdom and energy, and I am really thankful that I have been able to participate with the Board and learn from Anne. Anne Southall. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome everyone to the ESA Foundation Workshop. We are so glad you're here with us this evening as we develop into this topic of the ABCs of Parliamentary Procedure. Few of us have tolerance for someone who tries to play a game or a sport without knowing the rules. Learning the rules before you start playing seems to go without saying, yet members arrive at meetings, whether in person or more recent virtual meetings without being knowledgeable of even the basics of the rules I want to hear what's that going control, on that will control the process. Mm. There are many benefits to knowing the essentials of parliamentary procedure before stepping into another meeting to transact business. Members who know the essentials of meeting procedures can better get their views expressed and organizational desires accomplished. The presenter of our workshop this evening is Rosalie Griffith. Rosalie currently serves as a parliamentarian for the ESA Foundation. She is a registered parliamentarian and a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians. Rosalie also serves as president of the Oil Chap Capital Unit of Parliamentarians and serves on many boards, holding several leadership positions. We are recording today's program for future use, so we ask that you keep yourself on mute until the question and answer time. If you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to use the chat box and they will be answered at the end of the program. Please join me in welcoming Rosalie Griffith. I welcome everybody and I'm glad to see there's so many of you interested in parliamentary procedure. If you are a beginner to parliamentary procedure or experienced at presiding at meetings, we hope that you'll uh, learn some basic rules to being a good leader in conducting your uh, meetings uh, more eff uh, effectively. Uh, I need to stress uh, that parliamentary procedure should help members achieve their objectives rather than intimidate them. If there's a situation where you're on the spot and can't remember a specific rule, just don't panic. Using basic principles of common sense is a good place to start. So just don't panic. Let's talk about what is parliamentary procedure. Parliamentary procedure is a set of rules for conducting business and meetings at public gatherings. Robert Henry wrote his first book on parliamentary rules and practices in 1876. It consisted of about 200 pages. Today, the 12th edition of Robert's Rules of Order is 714 pages. So as you can imagine, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. The one thing about parliamentary procedure that people always get wrong is that most think there's one set of rules that must be followed by all meetings. That's not the case. Rules aren't one size fits all. Problems tend to occur when large meetings behave too informally and when small meetings behave too formally. Small board meetings and large membership meetings are conducted differently. Big meetings must be fairly formal to be fair, but the same formality can hinder business in a smaller group. Roberts recommends less formal rules for committees and smaller boards. 
Roberts provides that committees of any size and boards where there are not more than a dozen present, members present can follow more relaxed procedures, such as seconds to motions are not required. There are no limits on debate and the chair usually can de uh, debate and vote on issues. A similar misconception is that Roberts is the final say on meeting rules, not so. If there are state statutes that may apply on a particular organization, those would override the parliamentary manual. If the bylaws prescribe certain procedures, those too would be followed. Organizations can also adopt special rules that take priority over Roberts, sometimes called board policies or convention rules. Roberts is simply the default when there is no higher rule to the contrary. The takeaway is that organizations get to choose the rules by which they may be governed or will be governed. Why is parliamentary procedure important? Let's talk about that. It's the parliamentary procedure is important because it allows everyone to be heard and to make decisions without confusion. All members have equal rights, privileges, and obligations. Everyone has the right to be heard. So it's important for everyone to know enough about these basic rules to work within or run a good meeting. If you are serving as a parliamentarian for your state or chapter, you should be familiar with the basic rules of parliamentary procedure and your bylaws. Always have a copy of your bylaws close by in case you need to refer to them should, should an issue come up. And occasionally it does, and somebody might ask you, was well, that in your bylaws? So always have a copy of those, especially in a large meeting. Most, if not all organizations require rules to establish its basic structure and manner of operation. Henry Robert Arthur of Robert's Rules of Order said, where there is no law, but every man does what is right in his own eyes, there is the least of real liberty. And that's so true. Let's talk about the fixed agenda. That's laying the foundation for your meeting. A good agenda is worth its weight in gold. This is my best tip for keeping meetings short and to the point. A good agenda will make any meeting run better and save time. Preparing an agenda in advance will also allow everyone involved in the meeting to know what they can expect when walking in. This is useful as it will serve the meeting from going off course. It also presents dominant personalities or those with louder voices from taking over. But more than that, it keeps everyone focused on the business at hand. Your meeting structure, the meeting structure is dedicated, dictated by your agenda. An agenda is a list of items to be discussed in chronological order from beginning to end. If you are the presiding officer or chairperson, it is your responsibility to lead the meeting and to keep everyone on the agenda. This makes uh, sure that all points are raised and keeps it a productive meeting. The agenda, the agenda encompasses the following. Call to order. This is where the meeting begins. The chair will open the meeting and call to order. Roll call. Roll call is simply a way of checking attendance, who is there and who isn't. You all know that. Depending on an organization and the provisions it, it adopts, the number of members constituting a quorum may vary. Organizations should provide for a quorum in their bylaws, but where there is no such provision, 
the quorum is the number present at the meeting. Then next, you probably have your meeting and want to approve uh, your meetings of the prior minutes or prior meeting. At this point, the minutes from the previous session are confirmed. Ideally, with technology today, everyone will have had a chance to review those prior to the meeting and save valuable time going over them during this session. Minutes also do not need a motion to approve or be second if there is no changes or corrections. The chair can declare them approved and move on. The minutes should be signed by the secretary and can, they can also be signed by the president. I know I serve as secretary for an organization and they require that the secretary and the president, uh, you know, signs those. So I usually have the president sign them after they have been approved. The secretary uh, also does not need to use the term respectfully submitted by just sign her name and title. Then you have your report of officers. This is the point where the appointed officers, such as board members, share their notes, recommendations, and motions. As part of their roles, they, um, they will also uh, share their tasks, uh, what uh, has been done since the last meeting and any outstanding work that they have to do. Reports of committees, unlike reports of officers, reports of committees do not need to be seconded. And this is because uh, they reflect the recommendations of a group of people rather than an individual. Standing committees, um, they, these are constituted to perform a continuing function and remain in existence permanently or for the life of the assembly that establish them. Uh, the members uh, of such a committee uh, serve for a term that corresponds with that of the officers or until their successor uh, ha has been uh, chosen. And I'm sure that uh, if you're an incoming president or if you are a president, you know you're trying to fill all those committee assignments uh, every year. So they kind of change over uh, every year. Uh, reports of special committees, uh, special or temporary committees report on the tasks for which they are created. A uh, special or ad hoc committee is a, a committee appointed uh, as the need arises uh, to carry out a specific task and at the completion of which uh, their report or uh, they have made their uh, presentation uh, the, uh, to the organization, it automatically ceases to exist. And then you have special orders, which uh, hardly you ever, you rarely see, and that is uh, important business previously uh, designated for consideration at a meeting. Uh, then you have your standard uh, order of business, and this is the time to cover any uh, other reports that you may have. Unfinished business that has come uh, over from the previous meeting, action items, and more. Then you have new business, and that's when new uh, topics are uh, introduced. Announcements, we all know what those are. These inform members of any updates or announcements that everyone needs to be aware of. Uh, then you have your adjournment, of course, and the meeting ends uh, by a vote or by general consent or by the chair's decision uh, if it's time, if it's the time of adjournment, which was prearranged. Now, how do members get their say? They get their say by making motions. Members have a right to present motions. The member, uh, to make a motion, the member rises, raises their hand to get the attention of the chairperson. Someone, another member expresses support for their decision of another member's motion. And if you have a long uh, motion, and it's really detailed, it's always good to write it out and give it to 
uh, the uh, chairperson beforehand, if you know you're going to be making a long motion because that way it's detailed and everyone knows what they're voting on. And uh, because the secretary has to write out that and the, and the chairperson has to, you know, relay that motion exactly as, as it's stated. So it's always good uh, to know that. Uh, the chairperson uh, restates the motion and uh, then the members debate and give their opinion on the motion. The chairperson restates the motion and then first ask for affirmative votes or negative votes. And the chairperson will announce the uh, results of that of the votes. There are five general types of motions. You have your main motion. These introduce subjects for consideration. They cannot be made when another motion is before the assembly. They yield to privileged, subsidiary, and incidental motions. Subsidiary motions are these uh, changes or a uh, uh, these uh, changes or affect how the main motion is handled. Privileged motions, uh, these uh, concern special or important matters not related to pending business. In general, they are considered before any type types of motions except those relating to adjournment or recess. For example, if uh, a speech is going on, it cannot be heard in a certain part of the room. Uh, this would be an example of a question of privilege uh, requiring uh, immediate attention of the chairperson uh, to see if that uh, can be taken care of. Uh, other examples fall under the question of privilege is uh, the room temperature, it's too cold, it's too hot, the lighting, noise, you know, other disturbances. So that is a motion of privilege. Uh, incidental motions, these question procedure of other motions must be considered before any other motion as well. And um, then we have motion to table. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about tabling motions because there's a lot of misconception about that. But if you table a motion, it must be handled in the same meeting or you kill the motion. This is often confused with postpone the motion, which lay um, delay a vote, but can be reopened to debate. These enable certain items to be reconsidered. In general, they are brought up when no other uh, there is no other business. And when making a motion, if the board is in obvious agreement, the chairperson may serve uh, or save time by uh, stating that uh, if there is no objection, we will uh, adopt the motion too. Because if everybody looks like they're in favor of you know passing that motion, whatever it may be, then there's no use going through debate and voting and everything else. The chair can just take care of it. So. Um, she can say, you know, then hearing, you know, he, then hearing no uh, objections, the motion uh, is adopted. Some questions relating to motions. Is it in order? Your motion must relate to the business in hand. In other words, it must be germane and be presented at the right time. And it must not be obstructive, frivolous or against the bylaws. May I interrupt a speaker? Some motions are so important that the speaker may be inter interrupted. Do I need a second? Usually yes. The second indicates that another member would like to consider your motion. It uh, prevents, uh, prevents spending time on a question that interests only one person. And just because someone seconds your motion, it doesn't mean they're in agreement with your motion, but that they just would like to uh, hear more about it. So uh, is it debatable? 
Parliamentary procedure guards the uh, right to free and full debate on most motions. However, some subsidiary privileged and incidental motions are not debatable. Questions? Can it be amended? An amendment must relate to the subject as presented in the main motion. Note that once words have been added, they cannot be changed or removed during the same meeting except with a reconsideration of the vote. What vote is needed? Most require only a majority vote. A majority vote is defined as more than half of the votes cast. Can it be uh, reconsidered? Some motions can be debated again and revoted to give members a chance to change their minds. The motion to reconsider must come from the winning side. How do you present a motion? Hopefully most of you know how to do that, but here's what happens when you want a motion considered. You obtain the floor, speak clearly and concisely, State your motion affirmatively. Say, I move that instead of, uh, I move that we do not. Stay on the subject and avoid personal attacks. Another member will say, I second the motion, or the chair will call for a second. If there is no second, your motion will not be considered. When motions are made at the direction of a board or a committee of more than one person, they do not need to be seconded. The chair must say it is moved and seconded that we, after that happens, debate or voting can occur. Your motion is now assembly property and you can't change it without consent of the members. The chair asks either, are you ready for the question or is there any further debate? If there is no more debate or if a motion to stop debate is adopted, a vote is taken and the chair announces the results. The method of voting on a motion. The method of voting on a motion depends on the situation and on the bylaws of your organization or your chapter. And you may vote by voice, by roll call, general consent, show of hands, or ballot. However, it's described you're voting in the bylaws. You're, uh, you go according to what your bylaws uh, you know, say in how you do it. Requesting points of something. Certain situations need attention uh, during the meeting, uh, but they don't require a motion, a second debate or voting. It's permissible to state a point during a meeting where the chairperson needs to handle a situation right away. Board members can declare a point of order, a point of information, a point of inquiry, or a point of personal privilege. A point of order, it draws attention to a breach of rules, improper procedure breaching of established practices. You may have caught your chairperson you know, doing something that you didn't think or thought it was against the rules to do. So you can call for a point of order. Point of information, a member may need to bring up an additional point of information uh, in the form of a non-debatable statement uh, so that other members can be made fully informed on votes. So you just need more information and you can ask for that before you uh, decide to call for a vote. A point of inquiry, uh, a member may use a point of inquiry to ask for clarification in a report to make better voting decisions. And again, 
you may not really understand what's going on and you want clarification. And uh, so your chairperson can help you with that. A uh, point of uh, personal privilege. Uh, a member may use a uh, point of uh, personal privilege to enjoy, address the physical comfort of the setting, such as temperature and noise, as I talked about on the privilege motion. And members may also use it to address the accuracy of published reports or the accuracy of a member's conduct. More about voting. A motion uh, to lay on the table. This motion is used to uh, lay something aside temporarily to take care of more urgent business. It should not be used to kill a question. Members can take from the table a motion for reconsideration. This must happen by the end of the current or next session, depending on how soon the next session is scheduled. Members sometimes confuse it with uh, postpone to a certain time. A motion to postpone indefinitely. This is a parliamentary strategy. It allows members to dispose of a motion without making a decision for or against. This is useful in case of a badly chosen main motion for which either a yes or a no vote would uh, have um, unconsiderable consequences. It's uh, unusual uh, that this comes up again and usually it kills the motion. Electronic meetings, let's talk about electronic meetings. Virtual meetings through Zoom and other online platforms have their benefits, including saving travel time and allow members to participate who might not otherwise. Electronic meetings certainly aren't going away. I know personally the ESA Foundation Board of Directors had to learn a new way of conducting business during COVID. However, it has also saved the foundation a lot of money not to travel and incur hotel costs and expenses. We also have been able to meet more often and we get a lot of work done. This phase will continue for a lot of us. Hopefully those of you that continue to meet virtually uh, will have adopted some rules that are appropriate for these meetings. Regardless of the technology, electronic meetings must allow for simultaneously communication among all participants. Make sure participants are familiar with the process in which the meeting will occur and that they understand the details on how to participate. And so I am so excited that so many are on here tonight because you are all familiar with Zoom and you know how it works and what it takes to get you there. So uh, that's really uh, exciting. Um, and uh, if you have, have questions, uh, be sure to paste those. And I have uh, provided um, you uh, with uh, some references to help you along the way uh, when in doubt. All of these are excellent resources. I know they have helped me many times uh, with, with questions that I have had and they uh, continue to help me. Uh, parliamentary procedure is basically using your common sense. Don't let it get you down. Please feel free to contact me anytime and I will be happy to help you. Um, so this evening, I have just given you some very basic information on Robert's rules. I didn't want to go way into depth, uh, too much depth, because I didn't know how much you all knew, how much you didn't know, but I just wanted you to become familiar with handling meetings, you know, properly. 
And if you ever have questions, please don't feel free to uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is rosalie.griffith at aol.com. And, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of changes in Robert's rules. And every time there is a new edition of Robert's rules, something has changed. So just be aware of that and just kind of try and stay up. And this is my book on Robert's Rules, and I don't know if you all can see it, but see all my tabs and I'm constantly looking in. Someone asks me a question, I always want to be sure that I'm giving them the right answer and that I can answer them properly. So I always kind of double check myself. And uh, I serve uh, on a oil capital unit of parliamentarians as well. And uh, we always test each other. And it's always good to do, uh, you know, even amongst your small groups, your chapters, your states. And don't be so critical of uh, each other when you, you know, see somebody getting something wrong or just don't do it the way you thought it should be done or whatever. Uh, just help each other with that. And just like I said, use your basic common sense. And uh, you'll get along very, very well. And there's uh, just like the misconception of uh, every everyone thinks um, that uh, the meetings, uh, the meeting minutes need to be approved and seconded. You know, if that's how your bylaws state that they should be done, then do it that way. But Robert's rule says that's old, you know, it's old business. It's, it's the old way of doing things now. And so if there are no corrections, no changes, then, you know, just, uh, and if everyone has had a chance to review those and if you have sent them out to your members and they have all approved them, they see nothing wrong with them. Then when it comes time to approve them on the agenda, you know, the, they could just, it, the chair states, are there any corrections uh, to the minutes? And if hearing none, the minutes are approved as printed and just move on. And it saves so much time. Uh, so uh, don't be afraid to do that. And uh, look it up in Robert's rules if uh, if they if they think you're wrong, you know. So, uh, but uh, just take your time when you're doing things and uh, just like I said, use your common sense. And um, if you would like uh, a program on more detailed uh, information, we can, you know, certainly try and help you out uh, with that at, at some time. So, and were there some questions? So, uh, Ros Rosalie, I've uh, been collecting questions. So, if you'd like, I can go ahead and read them to you. Okay, and I see somebody ask if there's a possible, and that's all I saw. So I'll start for the first one. It's, can a motion be amended before it is voted on? Yes. Yes. Yeah, someone makes a motion. Yes, yeah, someone, and yes, yeah, someone can, uh, yeah. Yes, you can. All right, that's a pretty amended. succinct answer. I mean, you can, pardon me? So that's a pretty succinct answer. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's, yeah, just common sense. All right. You ready for the next one? Yeah. Define a secretarial change versus a change that requires a vote. And please use examples. I'm not sure what you mean by secretarial change. Whoever asked the question, do you want to unmute? Can we do that? Uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, sure. I, I don't know uh, by secretarial change. Does she mean the minute in the minutes with the minutes or changes to bylaws such as meeting days? And what about those changes uh, to bylaws such as meeting dates? You can change those. I mean, it depends on when your uh, bylaws are reviewed and. Uh, gone over everyone should have in their bylaws uh you know when they're reviewed hey, it, rosalie it, rosalie what about our example of um 
the change in the office location that's coming for the foundation office. The change in the office location might be a good example. The, the change in yeah, the foundation so, office? Yeah, so the, the, uh, that's in our bylaws, the address is in our bylaws. Our, our bylaws have been changed to update uh, and have been updated to uh, the way we provide. Right, but the uh, because the office is moving, headquarters office is moving. The uh, that change is uh, you had we had asked you about. Oh that yes, already. all yes, yeah. all of our changes uh, will have to be made uh, within the bylaws, and uh, that is just a special. Uh, I mean, there is nothing you can do about that. You will have to do that, and that's uh, you know your uh, board approves that. Those bylaws, I mean, those uh, changes will be made. So that's a, that's an example of a secretarial change to the bylaws. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 As long as your board, uh, your executive board uh, approves those, then you can do that. You don't have to go through the whole membership uh, to get a vote to uh, change an address because your executive committee can make you know, those changes. Okay. I've asked her if that answers her question and I'll wait and see if it doesn't, maybe we can drill down a little bit more. Yeah, she said, yes, yeah. it does answer her question. So thank okay. you. Okay. All okay. right, so, and then they have, what is your opinion of Robert's Rules of Order simplified and applied third edition? The third edition, Yes. Mm -hmm. We're on the 12th edition. <laughs> I, I can tell you, every time there's an addition to the Roberts rules, there is, yeah, there are changes. There we go. Yes. All right. Use it. Can everybody, can you hear me, Rosalie? Yes. All right. Um, this wasn't a question that just somebody said, would it be possible to have a future program to update and simplify bylaws and standing rules? I think that this is a really popular workshop, Rosalie. Oh yeah, I love bylaws. <laughs> I, 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 and I, in fact, I just got certified uh, uh, for uh, bylaws on bylaws. So I, I studied the bylaws, and so I had to be certified to talk about it. So yeah, that would be a good one. Good one to go over. Yeah, because there, uh, there's a lot of errors done, I think, uh, when you don't follow your bylaws, uh, you know, and, and that's why organizations set up rules and uh, you know, and there's a time when you can uh, suspend your bylaws and there's a time when you can't and you shouldn't really do that. And uh, most times you cannot do that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah. And just like I said, uh, when if you're a, a chairperson or, or a parliamentarian for your state or for your chapter, uh, just become familiar with your bylaws and uh, know what's in them. Uh, so you can help your, uh, you know, president, uh, you know, help or guide her through the minutes. Because there's sometimes you always have somebody in the audience that is going to challenge you about, you know, something. So uh, just be sure, you know, and even if, and if you, uh, you don't have to memorize that, you know, just have a copy there. So if there's a question come up, hold on just a minute, I'll look it up and just look it up and there's no big deal. Uh, and so it's better to have a right answer than a wrong answer. And I've done that many times, uh, you know, just have to follow the rules. So that, uh, you know, just uh, 
be cautious about how you handle people, um, you know, in the audience. Let them speak, let them have their way, and uh, let them be heard, uh, make them feel involved. Uh, so always stay positive uh, and uh, don't get flustered. Uh, we all make mistakes. Just stay cool and uh, just move on with it. So, but uh, yeah. And, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, so that's just normal. I mean, uh, don't be critical of, you know, someone because they didn't handle something just like the way you thought that they would or should. Uh, so that, um, but like I said, I just wanted to give you just kind of like the basics. And most of you probably know a lot of that, but uh, there are changes all the time that occur. So uh, just like, you know, I remember a long time ago when I was a secretary and took uh, minutes for a company uh, that I worked for, I always had to uh, sign my name submitted by, you know, and now that's changed. That is no longer necessary. And that's old school, according to Robert's rules, you know. So just, you know, sign your name and, uh, you know, your title and uh, move on. So, yeah. Anything else? I hope I helped uh, you all in some way. And uh, if you'd like more details and if you'd like one on bylaws, we can, you know, certainly try and set up something like that and, uh, you know, talk about bylaws. Rosalie, somebody typed something in. They said, what about people talking over the presenter? Can the can the parliamentarian interrupt? Uh, yes, uh, yes. And you should never do that. And if you are an acting parliamentarian, say, uh, sitting in the in the um, in the audience and there is a presiding parliamentarian, you should never challenge the parliamentarian that's sitting, uh, you know, up there in that meeting. Uh, another parliamentarian, that's very rude of another parliamentarian to challenge a, another parliamentarian. If she made a mistake, just let her go on. You know, I know I can sit in meetings and just cringe sometimes when I see something going on. But and they'll say, why don't you say something? Say something. But if there's another parliamentarian sitting at that table, it's very it would be very rude of me to challenge her. Uh, I could go up and speak to her later and, and talk to her about it. And then she can apologize to the members and say, hey, I was at fault. I, you know, but you, you don't ever do that to embarrass anybody. It's uh, not not very ethical. Yeah. So can I this is Robin Brown. Can I say something? Sure. What I meant was. Uh, if the parliamentarian is is up at the head table and there's people talking out in the audience, which yes. happens quite a bit, it, do I stand up and tell uh, them, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Either that or uh, have the chairperson say, you know, let's call to order. Call to, call to order? Call to order, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was that or if it was. Yeah, she can. Uh, your uh, the chairperson can tap her gavel and call to order. If okay. there's any commotion, people talking, you know, and uh, can't hear over someone else or doesn't know what's going on. If you hear a lot of commotion or see that, uh, you can uh, kind of tug your, uh, you know, your chairperson or president, you know, and let her know. Uh, that she can she can do that okay just yeah. wanted to make sure how it was properly done yeah and and if you're the parliamentarian and if you're uh if your uh, chairperson doesn't really recognize all of that or is afraid to say something you can do that okay yeah this was this was a lot of help thank you rosalie yeah because that uh, that is irritating when uh, yeah. people are talking amongst each other and somebody's trying to listen and uh, know what's going on and somebody else's, you know, it's very distracting. So yes, you can call to order. Okay. 
great. Yeah. All right. And let me tell you, the references that I gave you, they are wonderful. I mean, I have uh, learned a lot, you know, th uh, through a lot of them. And um, you don't have to memorize Robert's Rules. Uh, and there was one I gave you on the notes. It's called Notes and Comments on Robert's Rules. And it's by Jim Slater. And uh, it is very, it's brief and it's real easy to understand. And uh, you'll, if you get a copy of it, you will love it. 